name a business that has been ruined because it was over downsized. I cannot think of a single one, but if you ask me to name businesses that were half ruined or ruined by bloat, I mean, I could just rattle off name after name after name. It's gotten fashionable to assume that downsizing is wrong. Well, it may have been wrong to let the business get so fat that it eventually had to downsize. But if you've got way more people than are needed in the business, uh, I see no social benefit in having people sit around on half employed or, or, or unemployed. You're very likely to compete against some guy, some guy at some point who doesn't have more people around than needed in the business, too. But it doesn't change. For the people involved, they've got real problems. And uh, Warren, can uh, you name one that has been ruined by over-downsizing? There must be one. But well, it's like Eisenhower said about Nixon. Give me a week, and I'll come up, come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Historically... You know, every industry at all times is interested in, 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 in downsizing or becoming more efficient. Now, if the industry is growing, you can, you can achieve efficiency by doing more work or turning out more output with the same people. But, you know, if you go back uh, 150 years and look at the percentage of people in, in farming, for example, farming has downsized from being a very appreciable percentage of the American workforce to a very small percentage. And, Essentially, that's released people to do other things. So it's, it's in the interests of society to, do, to get as much output in anything as it can per, per unit of, of labor input. It's very difficult on the individual involved, and, and uh, you know, it's, 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 it's no fun. Uh, I guess it's no fun uh, being a horse when the tractor comes along, uh, or a blacksmith and, and when the car comes along. But the... Uh, the so I, I, don't, I don't quarrel with the activities. I quarrel sometimes with how it's done. Uh, and, and I do think there's been a certain lack of, uh, in certain cases, some empathy or uh, sensitivity in, in, in terms of the way it's being done. You should try to make, in cases, some empathy or uh, sensitivity in, in, in terms of the way it's being done. You should try to make that will require us off people over time because we hope that physical output grows and that that uh, that uh, we become more productive and 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 can keep the same number of people to, to get greater output. Dexter Shoe has done a great job of that over over time. They've become more and more productive, but they've sold more shoes instead of selling the same number of shoes and letting people go. But sometimes industry trends. I mean, at World Book, we have fewer people than we had a, a year or two ago, and we we didn't. We don't have any answer to that. Over time, we got out of the textile business. I wish we didn't have to, but it, it, we did not know how to run a textile company in New England and compete effectively. Uh, like I say, I would, I love avoiding those businesses, and to the extent we can, we will. I mean, Geico is going to add people over time, and I think Berkshire Hathaway is going to add people over time. But I can't, but it is in the interest of society to do jobs more effectively. It's also in the interest of society, it seems to me, for to take care in some way of the people that are affected by uh, uh, that activity. And either, in some cases, it's, it may be retraining, but in other cases, you know, it doesn't work so well if you're 55 years old and you've been working in a textile mill all your life and all of a sudden the guy that runs the place can't make any money out of, out of selling your output. I mean, that's not the fellow's fault that been working in the textile mill for 30 years. So. There's a balance in that. I think that the attention that's come about lately, I think there's to some degree it was a media fad based on on some particularly dramatic examples at a, a couple of companies. I I don't think there is more displacement going on now as a percentage of the labor force annually than there was 10 years ago in terms of uh, in, in terms of reconstituting what people do but it's gotten a lot of attention lately there could be a backlash on that uh, in terms of corporate tax rates or a number of things and, and and we might feel it in that direction we want at Berkshire to do everything as efficiently as we can part of that in a big way 
is not taking on a lot of people we don't need. I mean, uh, uh, a lot of the mistakes that are being corrected now are because people got very fat and their businesses got very fat in the past and took on all kinds of people they don't need. We see that in a lot of businesses that we're exposed to. And, and as long as they're very prosperous, really no one does very much about it. And then they, when the time comes, they all of a sudden find out they can get way more output. The oil companies are a classic example. You know, the, the, uh, the people probably actually needed to produce, refine, and, and market oil probably hasn't changed that much. But if you look at the employment relative to, to the uh, barrels produced, refined, and, and, and marketed, it's gone down dramatically over 20 years ago. To me, it just means that they weren't being run that well 20 years ago, and, and it never should have occurred in the first place. Uh, we, uh, we don't want to take on more people than never should have occurred in the first place. Uh, we, uh, we don't want to take on more people than businesses because we don't want to lay people off either. You have said that you like franchise companies, companies that, have, uh, uh, that are castles surrounded by moats, uh, companies that are possible to, you can have some prediction five, ten years down the road. But aren't businesses like uh, uh, Seas Candy, the furniture business, um, the jewelry business, the shoe business, businesses that are hard to predict the, the future five, ten years down the road? Part of it? Okay. Aren't these businesses hard to predict five or ten years down no, the road? I think, I think Things like shoe business. And yeah, I, I think they're far easier to predict than most businesses. I, I, I think I can come closer to telling you the future of virtually all of the businesses we have, and not just because we have them. I mean, if they belong to somebody else, then if I if I took the uh, the Dow thirty, uh, excluding the ones we own, or we or, or uh, you know, the first hundred companies alphabetically on the New York Stock Exchange, I think they're I think ours are way easier uh to predict. They're 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 fair they they tend to be fundamental things, fairly simple. Uh rate of change is not not fast. Uh so I I, I feel pretty uh pretty comfortable. I think when you look at 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 Berkshire five years from now, the businesses we have now will be performing pretty much as we've anticipated at this time. I hope there are some new ones, and I hope they're big ones. But I don't think that we'll have had lots of surprises in the present one. My guess is we'll have had one surprise. I don't know what it'll be. But I mean, you know, you, th that happens in life. But, but there won't be a, a, a series of them. Whereas if you, if we were to buy, uh, if we owned a, a base metals business or, or many, many retailing businesses I can think of, or uh, an auto business, uh, I'm not sure I'd know where we would stand in the competitive pecking order uh, five or ten years from now. It, uh, uh, I would not want to uh, try and come in and uh, displace these candies, for example, in, in the business it does, it, uh, or the furniture mart. It's just, it's not an easy job. So I, uh, I don't think you'll get lots of surprises with the present businesses of, uh, of Berkshire. But the key is, uh, is developing more of them. Zone four. And then two, I think that, that Wall Street generally has more envy, jealousy effects than, than uh, are typically present elsewhere. I have a friend whose grandmother used to say that she couldn't understand why people got into envy, jealousy, because it was the only one of the sins that you could never possibly have any fun at. And, but uh, generally speaking on Wall Street, I think a lot of people have had the wrong kind of grandmothers. Yeah, I've commented from time to time that uh, but today, Robin Leach has it all wrong on lifestyles of the rich and famous because he's presenting all these wonderful things that will happen to you if you get rich. But but they really aren't that all that wonderful, these fancy houses and boats and all that, that the real advantage of being rich, as I explain to people, is that it enables you to hate so effectively that if you're terribly rich, you know, and but you, you're 
your brother or you know, whatever, whomever, cousin or somebody is getting a little more attention in the world or something of the sort, you can hate in a very major way. You can hire accountants and lawyers to cause them all kinds of trouble. If you're poor, you just snub them at Thanksgiving and don't show up or something of the sort. But, the, but I've noticed that these rich people, particularly when they inherit great amounts of money, sooner or later they start, frequently they, 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 uh, they get very antagonistic toward siblings or cousins or whatever it may be. And they, and they really can, they can, they can hate in a way that, uh, or get envious in a way that the rest, you know, the rest of us really can't really aspire to. So that's the, that's a benefit that hasn't appeared on Robin Leach lately, but I, but you see that, you see a little of that in the athletic field and the entertainment field and perhaps even Wall Street that the, that making a million dollars a year looks great until this guy that sits next to you that can't possibly be as smart as you is making a million too. And then the whole world, uh, it turns into a very unfair place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Zone four, mm -hmm. so-called independent directors on such a board are probably receiving maybe $200,000 a year, maybe $300,000 a year. <clears throat> Believe me, they are not independent. They're independent <clears throat> as measured by some standards, perhaps of the SEC, <clears throat> but they, uh, you know, how would you feel about having a job that required you to go to work four or six times a year, pleasant company, you know, certain amount of prestige attached with it, and on top of it, you get paid maybe $300,000 a year, and you kind of hope to get another job like that. That is not independence. So you get a group coming in like that uh, from the comp committee, <clears throat> and in those 19 boards, I was put on the comp committee exactly once. Charlie might be able to tell you exactly what the result was that time. <clears throat> they do not look for Dobermans. Uh, they, they look for Cocker Spaniels, and, and then they make sure that the, the tails are wagging. And, but that is, don't condemn it too much, because you and I are doing similar things in other parts of our lives. Uh, you know, the, the social dynamics are important uh, in board actions. Uh, my son, Howard, in fact, my other two children as well, if they were involved, you know, they, they would have a dedication and do have a dedication to the culture of Berkshire, which is clearly defined. It's one of the reasons I want it clearly defined. And it's reinforced by the behavior and it's reinforced by results. And incidentally, their job would not be to set the compensation. Uh, I mean, the, the, the non-executive ch board chairman is not there to select the compensation uh, of the CEO or others. He's not there to select the CEO. He is there to facilitate a change if the board of directors decides the change is needed, and that's, that, that can be important, very, very, very unlikely to be important in the case of Berkshire, but it's a nice little extra safety valve. It's, and, uh, and Howie's the, per the perfect guy to carry that out. And uh, like I say, I, I, voted for, I voted for comp plans uh, at various places, including, uh, including way back, you know, at Coke, that were far from what I would have design myself, and the ones I designed myself would have worked, but that is uh, that is the way boards work. Uh, uh, I was made chairman of one comp committee, and Charlie can tell you a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Warren was totally voted down at Solomon Inc. In fact, people acted like, what the hell is he doing? How could he be disapproving compensation on Wall Street? And And I think the general idea that that a person should just shout disapproval all day long of everything he disapproves of uh, is very suspect. In the world in which we inhabit, people accomplish more if they pick their spots.